Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Friends of the Dunes Naturalist Notes webinar series. My name is Susie Fortner. I'm the Programs and Operations Director with Friends of the Dunes, um, and I'm going to invite my co-host to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I am Daisy Embrys Perez, and I'm the Outreach Manager for Friends of the Dunes. Thank you for being here with us for our very first uh, Naturalist Notes webinar of 2022. Um, we're, we're really excited to be hosting the series um, and we're just gonna kick it off with a land acknowledgement. Yeah, so I want to uh, begin by acknowledging that Friends of the Dunes and all of our staff are working and living on the unceded territory of the Wiat people, which include the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria, and Blue Lake Rancheria. Wiat people continue to be the working stewards of the lands, waterways, air, plants, and animals of their ancestral homelands, which include the lands between Palut Gasamuli, Little River, and Raski Hiwit. Bear River Ridge since time immemorial. The Wiat have survived the violent colonization, genocide, and attempted erasure of their culture and people. Today, I want to share this really wonderful website called honortax.org. Uh, through this website, you can give an honor tax to the Wiat. Um, and honor tax is a monetary way of recognizing and respecting their native sovereignty. So again, that's um, honortax.org. Um, and on your screen, you'll be able to see uh, some place names for locations near Wiki, Humboldt Bay, and Sulutluk, the native uh, Wiat language. So for each webinar, we will be introducing a Sulutluk word of the day. And today it is di'in, meaning into the woods. So I'm tuning in um, from Jurujiji, Eureka. Um, let me know in the chat box uh, where you all are tuning in from. Thanks, Daisy. Um, so this webinar series is hosted by Friends of the Dunes and Friends of the Dunes is a nonprofit organization dedicated to conserving the natural diversity of coastal environments through community supported education and stewardship programs. Um, if you haven't been there, uh, we also have this Humboldt Coastal Nature Center, which is our um, visitor center and our office for Friends of the Dunes staff. Yeah, so just a reminder that all proceeds for this webinar series will help fund the 2022 Coastal Naturalist Training. It's a California Naturalist Certification course. Uh, we were able to um, provide this program safely and in person in 2021, and we are very cautiously optimistic that we would be able to do it again in 2022. Um, so knock it on wood and um, yeah, hopefully again. <laughs> Yeah, the Coastal Natural Strain is such a great program, and I know we have a lot of people here that have been through the training, um, including our presenter this evening. So really great program. Um, encourage you to check it out on our website at friendsofthedunes.org. Okay, so our 2002 webinar series um, is kicking off to a start tonight with our first presentation by Justin Leg. So really excited about that and to introduce him in just a sec. Um, before we get there though, I just wanted to go over some quick Zoom etiquette. Um, so I see everybody's already sharing in the chat um, the places where they're tuning in from. Just a quick reminder in that chat, you can toggle between just talking to our hosts and panelists and talking to everybody. So I encourage you to use that toggle button to chat with everybody else that's attending the webinar this evening. Um, if you have questions for our presenter, please type those into the Q&A box. That's where we're gonna go at the end of the presentation to look for those questions for Justin. Um, and if that chat box or Q&A box is popping up and kind of getting in your way, um, you can click on that and drag it off your screen so it's not in your way anymore. You can also adjust your view that you're, um, seeing this webinar in, I think your options are like the side-by-side -side view, or you can adjust how big the um, presentation screen is versus the video screens. Um, okay, and just a reminder that these webinars are being recorded. Um, and so we will be offering um, the recording to the people who are registered for this webinar series or for the individual webinars. Um, and we will be sending a link to that um, before the end of the week for sure. I'm not sure how quickly we'll get it uploaded. 
um, but it'll be a password protected file um, that you can access and watch again for at least the next couple months um, in case you want to revisit any of these topics. Um, and we have some great topics coming up. So if you only registered for tonight, um, consider um, tuning into some of these other great presentations with some of our wonderful local experts. We're pretty excited um, to learn about these topics from um, some, some people who know a lot about them. <laughs> so without further ado, I would like to invite Justin Legg to join us. Um, and Justin is a experienced naturalist, interpreter and educator, um, and a certified nature and forest therapy guide. Um, and tonight he is going to be talking to us about um, nature therapy and forest bathing. All right, Justin, you there? Hey, Susie and everyone, thank you very much. Hope my hair is decent. Thanks for having me, super excited to be here. Let's see if I can Zoom present. Well, I'm so excited to have Justin here. Um, he actually used to be an employee of Friends of the Dunes. So I know him well and I'm really excited for this topic. Thank you, Susie. Can you see my, uh, oops, presentation there? We are currently looking at your Zoom screen actually and your presentation. Oh, there we go, there's the. Alrighty. <clears throat> well, I'm super happy to be here. Um, thank you for having me. Friends of the Dunes is the most amazing organization and you all should do the coastal naturalist training. It, it was a really wonderful experience and extremely worthwhile. Anywho, I've been working here in Humboldt County as a, a naturalist and for, for quite a while now but this concept of, of forest bathing, nature therapy, has really become a buzzword and, and increased a lot recently. And I'm really excited to speak to you all about it. Um, I know I've met a lot of y'all and have been experiencing nature in different ways with many of you and a, a few different capacities. So I've been with Friends of the Dunes, a glorious organization connecting schools and local communities to our oceans and coastal communities. I had a pleasure of working with a local kayak outfitter, Kayak Zacks, taking folks out on our Humboldt coastal lagoons. I spent some time with the Forest Service up in Lake Tahoe doing uh, official interpretive ranger, which was really wonderful. And a bit funny for us folks here in Humboldt County right now is I work actually for a, a national corporation, a, a KOA, and I wanted to share with y'all their, their mission statement before I went any further. I just came back from Montana hanging out with all the corporate leaders of KOA actually was a, a fun, interesting experience. But what really stood out for me was the, the humans there, how tight knit it was. And embarrassingly enough, I never even read their mission statement until I went to their training in Montana, which got me really excited. So that, that quote up at the top is actually KOA Corporate's mission statement, which I feel could be most of these other organizations' statement as well, helping to connect people to the outdoors and each other. Helping to connect people to the outdoors and each other. We could combine the words outdoors and each other in Justin's vocabulary to, to connect people to reality, to real life, which the outdoors and each other were all together there. So as a, a nature guide and an interpreter who's done all of these things and gone through the coastal naturalist training, which was a super amazing experience and some forest service official interpretive training and all these other things, I was actually a bit mm, not fully sold on going with the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy Guides and going through their training. So as a, a nature guide and a naturalist that had been leading these programs for many years, it was why, <clears throat> what's, what's new here? Why should I go through the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy to get 
an additional training, an additional piece of paper. What is this? I already take folks out into the woods and we already connect with nature. So I was pretty shocked actually going through this immersive training, how specific it was and how beneficial it was to my education and my philosophy as a nature guide. So I know forest bathing is a, a big buzzword and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it, but not everyone has heard of the origin of the concept. So this began in around the 1980s in Japan. What unfortunately was happening in Japan was a lot of their culture was transitioning into a, a tech-based economy. And what they were noticing was these folks working indoors, working on computers, staring at screens all day. And part of that culture was extremely pr productivity-based, was they were unfortunately working themselves to the point of exhaustion. Um, the term up at the top, karoshi, which I'm probably pronouncing very poorly in Japanese, uh, translates in English to, to, to work yourself to the point of suicide, to work yourself to the point of death. So this started in Japan because of that issue. Obviously, it's a massive tragedy to have a significant portion of your society working itself to death. That's a problem. What do we do? Dr. Ching Li started to lead some research into the concept. Their, their studies are wonderful. And what they showed was actually through control groups and a few different research programs was that when they sent folks into the woods, into nature, specifically into areas with evergreen trees, coniferous trees, that they actually saw this plethora of health benefits when they spent time out there, um, ranging from heart rate, blood pressure. I won't bore you with all the scientific details and factoids, but I'm more than happy to send you a ton of research papers. So because of the overwork in Japan and those unfortunate realities of the suicide rates really increasing, the Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare started to put money into researching how can we stop that. It's medical based in Japan. And nowadays, modern day Shinrin Yoku in Japan, Shinrin Yoku in English is where we get that term forest bathing. A little bit lost in translation there. We're not getting naked and swimming. Anywho, <clears throat> because of the, the forest bathing that Dr. Ching Li was able, the research and numbers he was able to, to come up with, they actually now have certified forest bathing trails. And so in Japan, when you go out to do Shinrin-yoku or forest bathing, you would actually go to an established nature therapy, forest therapy trail. You might sit down with a nurse who'll take your blood pressure, take a blood sample, maybe take a saliva sample. And they're looking for specific indicators such as cortisol levels, heart rate, blood pressure. Afterwards, you would tell them why you're here. It's like going to visit a doctor. Well, I'm here today because I'm stressed out, I'm depressed. Okay, take your blood pressure, take the samples. Well, Justin, you should go sit under that Hinoki cypress for 20 minutes and then go sit under this fir tree, after which you'll come back to the station, take another blood sample, blood pressure, saliva test, and they'll reanalyze your body indicators to see the overall benefit that the, the trees were able to have on you. So in Japan, Shinrin-yoku, forest bathing, the science, the medical physiological research behind it is all about sitting next to a tree and breathing. <sighs> Trees emit these chemicals. We call them phytoncides. You might call them essential oils. So many of us have this really strong memory of Christmas tree smell. Christmas tree smell, whatever species that was in your home, Douglas fir was for me and my family. 
uh, that is a, a phyton side and an essential oil. So because of Dr. Ching Lee's research, they've shown that these different chemicals and oils that plants, again, specifically coniferous trees, emit throughout the day when we inhale them as we move throughout forest environments and natural environments, there's an extremely strong physiological medical benefit to our hearts, cancer resistance, NK cell activity, it, all sorts of things. And the research just keeps coming out. So which comes to the association of nature and forest therapy and what I do here in Humboldt County in our massive old growth ancient redwood forests. So with the association of nature and forest therapy, we still of course reap the benefits. If you're standing next to a tree and you're breathing, you're getting that medical benefit. But the goal of nature and forest therapy as practiced by me is more of an emotionally based practice. It's physiological, psychological. It's more about our minds. It's about calming down. It's about being present. So I want to point out that <clears throat> forest bathing, the science, Shinrin Yoku, as a base of research and the science of the different chemicals that coniferous plants produce and their benefits to our bodies internally, medically, is very different from what we practice as nature therapy or forest therapy with the association of nature and forest therapy here in America. And that doesn't <clears throat> mean one is better. They are different. They're different. We have different goals. So a concept I'm going to come back to a few times likely, <clears throat> and that I encourage you all to ask yourself as you go throughout your days with quite a few different things is what, what is the point? What am I doing? So if my goal, my end point is just to reap the medical benefits and hopefully increase my cancer resistance for certain ailments, I might specifically search out a Sitka spruce or a Douglas fir, or again, a Hinoki cypress, where they've done most of the research with phytoncides in Japan to breathe in those chemicals. If my goal is to reduce depression, reduce anxiety, calm my mind down, have a refreshing day out in the forest, do I necessarily need to even be in the forest or around coniferous trees? Absolutely not. <clears throat> Here is our playground, everyone, Humboldt County, California. This is Stone Lagoon in Stone Lagoon Beach that actually I found some really rare uh, dune ecosystem plants on before, a pretty special place. So we, we are all really lucky to be here in Humboldt County with this diverse beauty and amazingness here. And before I go any further, I want to be clear because sometimes it's confusing talking about nature therapy. I, I am a nature guide. I'm a naturalist. I'm an interpreter. <clears throat> nature is the therapist. The forest is the therapist. The ocean is the therapist. This giant sand dune at Malel Dunes can be your therapist. So when we're talking about nature therapy, forest therapy, ocean therapy, it's similar to, you know, hot tub therapy, cold water immersion therapy. These things are therapeutic. They are good for us. And the more we practice them, the more we build them into our routines and make them a normal part of our daily lives, the more benefits we can see from these things. So when we're talking about nature therapy, forest therapy, it is the wisdom of the planet, these plants, the ocean, the world around us is what is offering us the therapeutic benefit. I strongly encourage you to attempt one of these programs with a certified guide. It really makes a big difference. Again, I wasn't really sold on it until I myself went on five or six guided walks. But it, it makes all the difference having someone there helping to open the doors, which let's dive in a bit deeper here. So 
a, a word I like to use a lot is remembering. It's fairly common that I'll be speaking to someone about this or walking with someone in the woods. And this is a, a true quote. I forget the gentleman's name. He is a friend with Nigel. We were talking on a radio program and <clears throat> said, you know, you know, kid, we used to just call that hiking. Y'all call it forest bathing or nature therapy or whatever. We just used to go outside. You know, we didn't make it that complicated. And you're completely right. That's the whole point. Um, kudos to Susie and Daisy and Friends of the Dunes for, for doing the land place acknowledgement and, and honoring the we ought there. So the, the word remembering, it's, it's not that this is a new concept. The research is new. The science is new, which is extremely glorious because we have proof, right? We have these, these facts, these numbers that we can show on paper that tell people that this is this is real but the fact is so many cultures so many peoples have understood these things have known these things and what's really amazing is when we start to talk about them with people that have forgotten is is how quickly it comes back into our minds and it doesn't feel like new information. It's it's remembering. It's it's familiar. It's our family. Um, this is a real picture, also, by the way. I don't know if you see the young lady in there, but when we're going into nature, when we're doing these things, when our what is the point? When our goal is to spend time in nature, to calm down, to breathe to reinvigorate our minds, bodies, and souls. Try to let your mind just be open and experience awe as it comes to you. This redwood tree here, Sequoia Semper of Irons, you would call this a cathedral tree, is just doing all sorts of wonky cloning and reiterating all upon itself. So it can be pretty mesmerizing to, to sit here. And I myself have spent quite a few hours just sitting at this tree, remembering and also wondering. Wondering is a word that we want to come back to as a nature therapy guide, what I would ask you to do when we come out on a program together, we, we call them invitations. We would practice a series of invitations. And an invitation is not a, an activity. It's not a requirement. It's like getting an invitation to a party, right? And you don't have to accept it you may accept it. But the great thing about nature therapy and forest therapy invitations is you can also accept it in your own way. So when we go into nature, it's good to try to have just a complete clear and open mind and let the experience happen for you instead of trying to prescribe the experience, which can be difficult. So what we can do for you as a nature therapy guide is take all of that from you, take it out of your realm. I've got my watch. I know the trail that we're on. I would ask you to simply be here and experience it. And it sounds silly and simple, but until you actually are enabled that experience to have a responsible adult with a first aid kit watching out for bears and sitting on the trail and making sure you're safe. Being able to fully deeply immerse into the moment with nature, with a tree. <clears throat> can be pretty spectacular. So this young gentleman is grounded in the forest. He is simply sitting at this tree. He is barefooted right now. 
we need to enable children this experience as well. When we move too fast in the world, I feel that is where our disconnection from nature has come from. If you joined this webinar with Friends of the Dunes about nature therapy, I imagine I don't need to really convince you that going outside, spending time in the mountains, being out on the beach at the ocean is, is good for you, is good for us, right? We've all heard John Muir quotes, go to the mountains and, and breathe the fresh air and it's the best way to, to make yourself happy and increase your contentment in life, which is glorious to be happy to be content. <sighs> so there was a moment I was in Yosemite National Park and these parents were next door to us. If you've ever been to Yosemite camping, you know that your tents are basically touching each other. So our fellow campers were no further than five feet away from us. And we're sitting there, my wife and I, and we're watching the first little brown bats come out and start to catch the mosquitoes as they're flying around the campfire. Our neighbors next to us, a couple of, oh, wow, bats, little brown bats. Did you see that, honey? Oh, wow, amazing. And a few seconds later, we hear the kids in the tent. Oh, really, mom and dad, you saw bats? That's really cool. Can we come see? Wow, amazing. And no kidding, true story. One of those nature memories ingrained into my mind, visceral here the parents shout back at their kids, no, you know, it's eight o'clock, it's nine o'clock, whatever it is, it's past your bedtime. You know, when we get home back to the city, we'll show you bats on YouTube. Don't worry about it, stay in the tent, it's your bedtime. So, oh boy, does that stand out as one of the most sad and shocking nature experiences of my life to not enable a person to not allow a person to to be there in the moment so that is just my reminder and my hope to encourage you all when you're going out into nature the beach the forest your backyard to encourage each other to try to calm down to to slow down to not worry about specifics too much and if any one person like this young man, if you feel a pull, if something in nature is calling to you, is tugging to you, wow, that rock in the river over there is shiny. I kind of want to touch it. I don't know if you all have ever had that feeling. Go do it. Allow that to happen. Here is me at a very special place to me in Lady Bird Johnson Grove, where Redwood National Park was dedicated, there's a really special tree, the sequoia there. And my hand in this picture is touching a giant scar on this tree. After the federal government protected Redwood National Park and established it as a national park, this person from the local community felt offended for whatever reason, the government taking my jobs, long story, the complicated politics of Redwood National Park. Regardless, this human being came with a chainsaw and tried to kill this tree to protest what he felt was an extremely negative thing, the protection of this national park. So I'm here today as a person that's been from a few different organizations and I'm, I want to speak a bit about reality, real life stuff, nature versus fairy tale land stuff, the, the imagined. So it's really wonderful to all hope and dream that we'll all be 
100% content and 100% happy and satisfied 100% of the time, 365 days of the year. But that's not really the case for most people and most places on earth, right? Um, I don't know about y'all, I'll make some assumptions here, but the last couple of years with this crazy thing that's been going on in the world has been a bit intense, right? We've all been sort of sheltered and protecting ourselves and that part of our evolution, our psychology, it's, it's, we've been all amped up, our heart rate, my heart rate, my levels of anxiety and depression, I'll be real here, everybody. What brought me to this practice and why I like to be real with it is I think sometimes we get a little shy about talking about real life stuff. And again, we just want everything to be perfect in fairy tale land. I'm happy, I'm rich, I'm successful. And it's okay if things are not absolutely perfect every single day, all the time, right? Doesn't have to be fairy tale land. So when we go out and we actually get intimate with the land, when we slow our minds down and connect with nature, I wanna let y'all know that can lead to really big emotions. It's uncommon on a nature walk talking about trees and doing environmental education. It is uncommon to have people break down in tears on a nature therapy walk when we allow people to process their inner emotions and just spend time in silence it is very common for folks to have really big thoughts really big emotions what we do in our minds, we're all so busy all the time as we, we kind of hide them down and we work them into our systems and then we focus on work, we focus on whatever that game on our cell phone is, we focus on, you know, the sports game happening tonight. It gives our, our monkey minds, it gives our brains something to concentrate on so we're not actually diving into these deeper things in our lives. So when you're first really immersing yourself and practicing these concepts of nature therapy, it's, it's not uncommon for pain and traumatic experiences that you might have had to to bubble forth into the forefront of your mind i i don't have the answer for all of that but know that spending time in nature being in nature allowing it to just be there for you can really help with that healing nature is extremely resilient specifically Sequoia sempervirens and our relationship with plants and the earth and nature, if you allow it to be, well, excuse me, not if you allow it to be. It is reciprocal. The more reciprocal you make it, the more reciprocal it will be for you. As in the more I give to the earth, the more I give to my fellow humans, the more the earth and my fellow humans give back to me. This is a very special tree. I've never visited her. This tree experienced much more trauma than the tree at Lady Bird Johnson Grove. Many of my Humboldt friends likely know what this photograph is just because of the steel bracings, but this is the famous tree Luna that Julia Butterfly Hill was able to, to I dedicate herself to, to protect it. Afterwards, it was also vandalized much more deeply by an individual, but still today it stands as a testament to the, the resiliency of Sequoia sempervirens and just nature on earth. I feel compelled to tell you a, a quick story. 
as we talk about trauma and real life and big emotions. Wow, did we think that this was going to go this direction? And who was Sequoia, eh? I went to Humboldt State University and my mama took me and my brothers up to Yosemite National Park each summer as a child. So redwood trees, giant sequoia and coastal redwood sequoia sempervirens have always been a big part of my, my nature life. And I've always felt educated about them. And I never even heard the story of Sequoia until years after I graduated from Humboldt State University. Long story short, Sequoia was a Cherokee person. He was alive 1770 to 1840 that you'll see there. And what his legacy was, was he created without any real support or help from his tribe, the Cherokee tribe or anyone else, Sequoia developed and built the first alphabet, the first written language of any indigenous native culture of this country, North America. And he did that, I believe, to help enable us to, to communicate, to work together. I don't need to tell you all that around the, that time period when Sequoia was dedicating his life to establishing the first written alphabet of any Native American tribe in this country, relationships between his people, the Cherokee and American settlers, they were not great. They were not good. So he saw that negative energy and he dedicated himself. What can I do? What's the point? Do we want death and destruction and fighting and hatred this whole time? Or do we want to find some way to have unity and communication and discussion? And so nature and reality and real life doesn't always mean best friends and happiness every single day. But what it does hopefully mean is honesty and truth and communication, because without honesty, without truth, without communication, how can we as life on earth get to the next point that we're trying to do, get to? Here I am with my machete as a bramble destroyer. Right after I came back from this training as a forest therapy and nature therapy guide, I came back to the property I worked at and I wanted to give back to the land. This archway you see is all of the invasive species, the, the invader, the mean guy, the big guy that came in to what used to be an old growth redwood ecosystem and suffocated out all of Justin's friends that needed to support some thimble berries, some blackberries. So actually getting where you live, where you work, where you are, getting into the earth, working with the land, blood, sweat, and tears, support another life form is one of the best therapeutic ways that you can spend time in nature. So to get to some specific invitations for nature and forest therapy, but without going out with a guide, you can absolutely still reap a lot of these benefits. There's some great books you can read. Dr. Ching Li, who I mentioned, of course, wrote, wrote the book about forest bathing. And I'll, I'll share with you a few invitations here today. Some that we might not even think of as nature and forest therapy invitations. Mm -hmm. Things that we did with Friends of the Dunes, like plant identification. So the whole goal of nature and forest therapy is to get us into the present moment. Be here now, a lot of us Humboldt folk have heard. I myself 
folks try to get me into meditation, learn about meditation. It's so good for you, right? Like do meditation for 15 minutes a day. You sit over there and you think about nothing and it allows your subconscious to do all these great things. Wow, wonderful, amazing. Well, I can't do that. I have ADD. I'm really hyperactive. I can't sit still and not think about anything. So forest and nature therapy enables us to reap similar benefits, but it also gives people like Justin something to kind of do to think about. So here, what you're looking at, this beautiful Venn diagram is covering the Eel River where I live right now. And I'll, I'll admit I'm extremely blessed and lucky that this is what I consider, well, it's kind of my front yard, not my backyard. Anywho, what I do y'all and what I encourage y'all to do it's good for you. It requires discipline. It needs to be part of your routine. It requires motivation. Is to just go sit somewhere. This spot should be your front yard, your backyard. This spot should be within minutes, if not seconds, of your front door or your back door. This spot should be extremely easy to get to. This spot should not require driving. And this spot does not need to even be in the forest or a national park or anywhere amazing. Your backyard is great. Anywhere with some nature works. And what we'll do is we'll just sit there. If you can make this part of your routine, a daily sit spot, sit, wonder, think. Focus on what's right there in front of you. Again, hyperactive Justin needs something like the river or the ocean or an animal. It gives me something to look at and think. And what I'm practicing is active thinking. Wow, I can see the sun is sparkling on the water over there. I'm actually verbalizing what I am seeing in my mind. And what that does is it just puts me completely in the moment sitting here at the river. I'm not thinking about work, not thinking about my significant other. I'm not thinking about how I just ordered that new headlight for my car that I need to replace. Oh boy. So, which brings me to the point that we have to make time for this. We always say this to ourselves and we hear from others like, I'm so busy, I can't do that, I'm sorry. And I myself am busy and have to cut things out of my schedule all the time. But what's the point of life? What's the point of being here and what are we doing? And if some of our goals are allowing ourselves to be happier and more content and more calm, the only thing that helps Justin do that is by allowing myself quiet, silent, alone time in nature. When I go out with my significant other or my friends now, I encourage y'all to try this. We walk in silence and we encourage each other to not talk to each other to listen to the wind, to listen to what's around us. And it sounds the opposite of relationship building, but walking in silence in the woods with your significant other and then debriefing it with each other, asking, wow, what did you notice? What did you feel? Try it out sometime. So here we have the sorrel carpeted floor of the Redwood Forest at the Avenue of the Giants. That phrase that I threw out there is one that I repeat daily a thousand million bajillion times. And there's one I encourage y'all to repeat a thousand bajillion a million times. It is the phrase to use walking in nature, sitting at the beach that enables our brain to stay in the moment and reap these benefits of nature. To reap the benefits of nature, all we have to do is be focused on the present moment. To be focused on the present moment, just ask yourself in your mind repeatedly, what am I noticing? I am noticing that splash of sunlight hitting the sorrels is 
crazy bright. It's like almost white. And then over there, that color of green is a little bit darker. And you know, when you follow up those trees, it's not actually lichen. That's the sediment line from that flood. What was it? 1964. Oh boy. Oh wow. But just try it out, y'all. Find a spot in your backyard. Find a spot in the woods. Stop. You need to stop. You need to sit there and ask yourself, what am I noticing? Who is this guy? This is crazy Justin doing the opposite of what nature and forest therapy is all about, which is why I wanted to include this picture in the slideshow. That's Lake Tahoe in the background. That's Fallen Leaf Lake in the middle of the right hand of the screen. So when I was working up in Lake Tahoe, I decided I wanted to do this. It was a crazy hike. It was like 10 miles up a mountain and back down. I did it all in one day. And I was rushing the whole time because I knew how many miles I had to get to. And then you get to the scree field and you had to watch out for the snow. And then there was some tourists there. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. You probably should turn around. Like, be careful here. You don't want to get hurt. Anywho, we often conflate the benefits of spending time in nature with extreme activity. And that the only way to get these amazing benefits that we hear about people that have spent like years in the back country, right, is by spending weeks and weeks and weeks outdoors by yourself and getting really dirty or climbing Mount Everest, which is absolutely not the case. Some of the most amazingly powerful and memorable nature experiences that have changed my life have been going absolutely nowhere. I had the pleasure of meeting this amazing person, the great grandson of John Muir, Michael Muir. He was born wheelchair based. His organization, his nonprofit organization takes wheelchair based folks out into nature in the Bay Area. You think they're doing 50 mile hikes up a mountain and spending days and days in the wilderness? Absolutely not. What they are doing, though, is getting out of their normal realm, getting into nature and having this experience where they're allowed to, where everything is, all the barriers are taken away and they're allowed to experience it. I don't know if you can see how giant that lady's smile is that Michael Muir is looking back onto her. That's his wheelchair over by the van in the corner. But oh boy, how powerful was that experience for her? So... Michael Muir's quote there, we focus on what is possible, not on what we have lost. I love this picture. We'll get back to that. <clears throat> so we focus on what is possible, not what we have lost. What is possible, not what we have lost. This woman is standing on a stump on the edge of Lady Bird Johnson Grove. What you're looking at is and was in 1968 Redwood National Park. That's what the first visitors to Redwood National Park got to come to see, which brings me back to my point of what's the point, real life, reality, what are we doing, what's going on here. When I was working with Friends of the Dunes, which was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And I would love to go back there, honestly. I, the only negative thing that happened to me there, I was really passionate and excited was I sort of, I was cursed with this thing where everywhere that I went now, I saw the invasive species everywhere. I saw the negative aspects in the ecosystem if I came here to Redwood National Park, I saw the second growth. I saw the English ivy. I saw the scotch broom. I saw the impact of what these humans have done to this land. And you can't escape that anywhere. But we have to move on also. And it reminds me of just our culture and ourselves here in America. We, we like to forget these pretty massive and significant traumas that we've experienced and, and brushed them under the rug. We don't like to talk about them very much. The Native American genocide throughout this country, for example. But that doesn't make them disappear. And they're part of us and this land and this culture. Stump love, that 
in that denotation in the corner is a reminder for me. I know a lot of y'all are Eureka based, Arcata based, Manila based. Of course, I love Redwood National Park, but one of the best places for these types of experiences can be the Arcata Community Forest. I have had some of my favorite sit spots sitting on a, a stump of a tree still in a, a living working forest. It's, they don't speak our language, conifers, sequoia, sempervirens, and human beings were a little bit different, but if you pay attention, if you sit there, if you listen, there's some lessons, y'all. These folks I had the pleasure of experiencing some time in the forest with. And the message here, when we're in nature, the more we can use our senses, sound, smell, touch, scent, that just enables us to, again, the goal is to forget about real life and just be here in the moment. To be here in the moment, use your senses. Sit next to a stream, hear the gurgling. It is insane how little of time, if you pause and think about it, how much time are you ever away from human sound? Right now, if I shut up, I could hear the refrigerator in this room running. There's always some sort of unnatural human-made sound, which is why the beach, the dunes, the ocean, Trillium Falls here, the creek, Eel River, Mad River, the sound of water, that natural sound, because it's so loud, can really enable your mind to, to calm and focus on the moment there. Just some beautiful pictures, y'all. So here I am inside a burnt out redwood. I share these macro pictures because again, you don't need to walk miles through the forest. What has continued to shock me since I've allowed myself to do it, I used to run through the forest just like everybody else. And I had, you know, my to-do list of plants I was here to identify or invasive species I was here to pull or specific sequoia sempervirens that I'm trying to show these guests so that they appreciate this forest fully. But oh, hey, just stop, just pause, just stare. Again, what am I noticing? What am I noticing here? Many of us can do it in many different ways. I wanted to show off my beautiful nature journal. Ha 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 ha, that's a joke. Your nature journal doesn't have to be that beautiful. Connecting with nature, if writing it down helps you, it helps me, wonderful. Just do it, y'all. Don't worry about it, you don't have to be perfect. I only share this to embarrass myself, but this really connected me with these plants, with these animals, when I actually stopped and wrote down what I could envision in my brain and my memories of these plants and animals, it can really help connect you to that place and just be a very calming activity. What are you noticing, y'all? Please find a spot, your backyard, as close to you as possible, that you can sit and be in nature. As a nature guide that's had the most glorious reality of getting to go out every single day with folks from across the world, sometimes folks have asked me this question, you know, Justin, isn't it super boring? You go to like the exact same place every single day, over and over and over and over and over and over again, same beach, same forest, same tree, you sit there every single day. Isn't that just, why? The more you notice, the more you notice, the more you notice, the more you notice, it's spectacular. This was my old sit spot in Freshwater, California. I moved that feather to be quite honest, but I'm walking through the woods to my sit spot and I found an osprey feather and a little bit further, I found that surf perch out in Freshwater, California. I'm not sure how many miles that actually is from the ocean, but oh boy, it was quite a few. Cathedral Trees Trail, y'all. 
you know, they say I'm not a religious expert here. I'm not trying to dive into that realm, but there's quite a few folks that have had books written about them or for them that say some of their most impressive experiences in life were because they spent an immersive time in nature. John Muir himself, only by going alone in silence without baggage, without baggage, alone in silence, can you get truly into the heart of the wilderness. This isn't for everyone, but I want to encourage y'all, if you can turn off your phone, if you can dedicate six hours, three hours, one hour to a, a small walkabout, a medicine walk, just find a place where you know you'll be safe, where you can be immersed in nature, in the canopy of a tree, in forest, in your backyard, sitting on the beach in the ocean. Try to allow yourself a significant amount of time to be there. Just keep asking that one simple question, what am I noticing? If you can do that once a year, it can be super duper wonderful and beneficial. So I just want to say again, as a, a formal naturalist, as an environmental educator, I was working as an interpretive ranger with the forest service. Sometimes I got really caught up on the specific curriculum or what are these kids supposed to be learning? Or, oh my gosh, if these adults don't know that Sequoia Semper Virens and these second growth forests are like the earth's number one carbon sequestering reservoir, 2.6 gigagrams of CO2 per hectare of forest. How are we ever going to do more forest conservation and how are we going to get this done? Oh my gosh. Oh boy. Oh wow. Enabling people to just be on the land, connect with the earth, where they are. What's the point? Let's enable our fellow humans to be content, to be healthy, to be happy. I think the more we can allow ourselves to be content, to be healthy, to be happy, the more our fellow humans will try to support the, the natural world around us. So I wanted to end on this picture here. I was excited when my mom moved here. This is the hills where John Muir's family lived. This is known as the John Muir Historic Site. And I heard a rumor that John Muir sat under this tree. And then I had that bubble bursted by the park rangers at the historic site. Like, absolutely not, Justin. Like, that's just a stupid stone chair that some rancher built up there, kind of like a fireplace under that tree. And people started calling it John Muir's chair. What's the point? What's the goal? My point, my goal, I want to be a content. I want to be happy. I want to be a healthy human being. I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be full of anxiety every day. I can enable that in my life by connecting with nature, by engaging with nature, by allowing myself enough time to spend outside in solitude, not thinking about anything else except what am I noticing? What are those clouds doing? Wow, that looks like a zebra today. What am I noticing? This has been life changing for me as a person that felt he was really competent in the natural world and engaged in it, allowing myself to st stop analyzing it, stop thinking about it, just go out there, just sit there, let it be. What are you noticing in your sensory experiences? It can be pretty spectacular, everybody. Um, I could speak for hours and hours and hours and hours, and I tried not to overwhelm y'all with any too specific data or science, but on that note, I am more than happy to share any science and research papers with you all. There's a ton of them, um, so please reach out. I'm an easy guy to find, and I'll send everybody, I'll send Susie and Daisy my contact information and would, would love to connect and discuss more with y'all, everything about phytoncides and nature and forest therapy.
Thank you so much, Justin. Oh my gosh. Okay. So um, lots to process here. We are at 7 p.m. So um, if people want to jump off the call, I completely understand. Um, and if you want to stick around for some Q&A with Justin, we will do that. So if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A. Justin, why don't you go ahead and stay the screen. Um, you're kind of looking at your screen right now instead of your screen screen. I know you have lots of awesome pictures to share. Well, <laughs> there we go. OK, cool. So yeah, um, thanks, everyone, for attending. Hopefully, we'll see you next week if you're going to jump off the call. But yeah, we'll stick around and ask your questions to Justin if you have them. Um, I don't see anything in the Q&A just yet, um, but we might be typing it up. Um, but yeah, so much relatable stuff in your talk, Justin. Oh my gosh, I just have to say like the bats in Yosemite story as an environmental educator that really like struck a note with me, parents not letting their kids see the bats. Um, I used to work you know, at a aquarium type of facility, educational facility down in San Francisco Bay. And I had one parent once be like, don't touch the mud. <laughs> You're gonna get dirty. And I was like, no, touch the mud. That's the whole point of being here. So um, very relatable. Um, and yeah, just, I mean, we were talking about anxiety and depression. I'm just thinking this past two years have been rough on everyone, really rough on students for sure. Um, so, you know, this, I always think like, oh yeah, I'm spending quality time in nature. I'm getting my like dose of nature therapy, but I'm one of those scientifically minded people that's out there like making an e-bird list, posting stuff to iNaturalist, <laughs> like <laughs> got my binoculars out, my cell phone. And um, so, yeah, you're definitely encouraging me to, to stop and slow down and take it all in. Um, so I appreciate that. I definitely want to put some of these practices to use for sure. Um, okay, Daisy, do we have any questions over there in the Q&A? Yes, we have uh, our first question is, how do you go to a forest bathing invitation? So I'm guessing like, how do you go to one of your forest bathing um, walks? <laughs> uh, well, a really wonderful thing is there's a couple additional guides in Humboldt County now. Um, one I went through the training with, her name is Scarlett. She is a mother in McKinleyville. Um, the association, A-N-F-T dot earth. I'll type it into the chat, the association of nature and forest therapy guides has a, if I could spell there, has a, a, a list on their site actually. So anybody all across America can go on their site and find a, a certified guide to help lead them through these invitations. And what's really special about it is they've made this standardized sequence. So what's great about going out with a standard or, or a certified guide, it's um to make a weird comparison, like when you go to McDonald's, right, you always get the exact same hamburger. So when you go out with a certified nature and forest therapy guide, they're going to be going through a very specific sequence of invitations to help enable your mind to flip certain switches to let your brain get into what you might call a liminal space or the be here now space, the flow zone, which is when we get all those really great uh, benefits. Like if you're a, a surfer and stuff, a lot of surfers have heard of the, the flow zone um, and a lot of other athletes. It's common in adventure sports and really active things, but it's not often associated with more, more calm activities, but it absolutely can be. It's just the trick of getting your brain to flip certain switches to enable it to be in that space. A lot of us, I should mention, like if you've ever gone on like a 15 day backpacking trip, you've sort of noticed how your mind gets in this zone. And so the goal of nature and forest therapy and using these other methods is to try to enable that zone in less than 15 days, you know, hopefully a couple hours. Sounds so wonderful. Um... Susie, do you want to say the next question or? 
Sure, yeah, we've got one here from Laura, another naturalist graduate. Um, so what was the process to get certified in forest therapy? Um, cost, and then she wrote lotion, but I think she might have meant location. <laughs> I'm gonna guess that means location. <laughs> I'm personally interested in this one too. <laughs> um, it's changed a little bit with COVID and all the education systems having to adjust. So I actually really love the model now. When, when I joined it, it was sort of backwards and we did a six day immersion and they happen across the world. They're, they're doing one in Switzerland uh, soon and one in Poland, maybe. I, I really wanted to go to the one in Costa Rica, but I actually ended up going to a session here in California. Um, so they're ongoing throughout the year. And right now, the way it works is it's a six month Zoom session self-guided experience where you go through the handbook and you learn the methodology. And then after the six month online training, then you go to the six day in-person immersion where you practice it with them and learn it in person. What I did was, was the opposite. We did the six day immersion followed with the six month class. Um, so I, I think it's pretty great the way they do it there. Um, the cost, I'm not sure, but the location is all over the place, which is really wonderful. Association of Nature and Forest Therapy. Really great people. The funnest thing is like Friends of the Dunes, sorry, it's hard to get Justin to shut up, is all the great people there that I've met and we all have these forest therapy guides and just like Friends of the Dunes, we all totally support each other because the whole goal is enabling people to be happy and content and connected with planet Earth, which I think can benefit all sorts of different things. So it's, it's a great community to join in. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, it's just, it, it's really striking me what I was thinking a lot about while you were talking is like, there is, are a lot of techniques that I will use with kids. Like I will have kids stop and listen and have a sit spot and do some nature journaling and, um, you know, just spend some time just sitting and like, what did you hear? What did you notice? But I don't often incorporate these with adults. Um, and I'm just kind of curious, do you, do you find that adults are a little bit more resistant to this technique than kids might be? Or do you have any um, experience or tips for, for getting adults to be a little bit more open to it also? Adults totally can be more resistant. I think you just have to burst the bubble. Like what we, when we hang out with adults, when we do this with the adults as part of the introduction, I like to tell folks, um, one of the invitations that was on my slideshow that I didn't talk to y'all, we just call what is in motion. And so all you do is you walk extremely slow and notice things that are moving, that are physically moving, a leaf shaking, sand blowing. And so we always introduce it by telling folks, this is gonna be really awkward for you. You've never walked this slow probably, and you're not used to doing this, but it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be awkward. You might feel weird. And I like to use the word childish. Like you might be feeling silly, goofy. Like, why am I doing this? But they're invitations. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. There's no gold star. The whole point is just to be there for yourself. So basically calling the adults out that they're lame and you're going to feel silly and childish. And those aren't bad words. Those can be positive, really good things. Yeah, adults should be more childish more often. It's true. So true. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Justin. I see lots of thank yous in the chat um, and lots of people just saying good reminder and good tips for stopping and slowing down. Um, so if you, hopefully you get a chance to read all those. 
Um, I'm just thinking, you know, we got one email today that somebody thought this was a walk and they're like, how do I sign up for the forest therapy walk? And I was like, gosh, I wish it was a walk. It's a webinar. <laughs> it's on Zoom. But um, moving forward, maybe we'll have to talk about doing one of those in the dunes sometime. So um, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Uh, <laughs> hopefully we can do it safely. Um, and if we schedule something like that, we will definitely let you know. Justin, I appreciate you very much. Um, thank you so much for being here and for chatting with us. Um, and yeah, I don't see any other questions. So I think we'll just wrap it up. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, friends of the dunes. Thank you, Justin. Thanks everybody for being here. <laughs> All right, bye-bye.